All right, welcome back. This is our second part of our chapter one lecture. So biology is the study of life, but what defines life? Like how do we know if something is a living organism or not? Let's look at these four pictures and see if we can determine if something is alive or not, right? So here on the top left, we have these flowers, a plant. Yes, we know in general that plants are alive. They go through photosynthesis. They can take light and carbon dioxide and water and make carbohydrates and oxygen for us. So plants, these flowers are alive, yes? How about this orange over here? Let's try to ignore that mold for a second. Oranges, are they alive? I know they're alive when they're stuck to the tree because we said plants are alive, but what if I pluck it off of the tree? Like, are the cells still alive? They are. And then for how long? It could be a few days. Uh, how long do they stay alive? What about this mold over here? Oh, that definitely looks like it's still alive. It's still growing. How about these rocks down here on the bottom left? In general, we tend to know that rocks are not alive, although there could be a bunch of different types of microbes on there or somewhere in there that we can't see that are alive. How about the influenza virus that causes the flu? Are viruses alive? Interestingly, they're usually not considered to be living. So overall, usually but not always, we kind of know when something is alive or not, is living or not. So let's look at the specific characteristics that living organisms have that allow them to be considered alive from a scientific standpoint. Here we have the properties of life. These are characteristics that all living organisms, at least as a species, have. And we're going to go through each one in detail. The first property of life is order. Organisms are extremely organized and they have coordinated structures that are made up of one or more cells. Interestingly, the cell is the smallest unit of life. And strictly speaking, to be considered alive, an organism has to be comprised of at least one or more cells. The second property of life is sensitivity or response to stimuli. So we have to be able to respond to our environment. Our book gives us an example of this plant, the mimosa plant. And my kids like to call this the touch plant because when you touch them, the leaves fold up. So all living organisms have to have receptors that can respond to the environment, such as this plant, or for example, us, if we touch something like a hot stove, we'll be able to feel that, to sense that, and move our hand away before it gets, it gets even more hurt. Even bacteria and fungi can sense food, something around them, and they can move toward or away from that material, those chemicals. Here's a pretty neat example of a response to a stimulus. Here we have a slime mold. This is the slime mold over here. It's a type of protist. And it's put, it's set within a Petri dish over here where they put a maze. They designed a maze and set that into the Petri dish and put some food in the middle. And somehow the slime mold can sense that the food is there and can solve the maze and reach the middle where the food is. The next two properties of life are reproduction and adaptation. So as a group, as a species, living organisms have the ability to reproduce. This could be a single-celled organism that divides into two new identical cells or more complex organisms like humans who reproduce through a process known as sexual reproduction. Adaptation is another property of living organisms. Living things tend to fit their environment, like these nectar-feeding moths, that have a proboscis, this tube right here, it's almost like a tongue, that has a length that matches the size of the flowers from which they feed. Our book also provides examples of heat-resistant organisms called archaea. 
that can live in boiling hot springs. These archaea can also be found in mud volcanoes like the one shown here. In fact, these microbes um, can even survive, many of these can even survive the example from the first part of the lecture in outer space habitats that might be similar to Mars. Growth and development and regulation or homeostasis are also properties of life. So growth and development of organisms results from the passage of genes from parents to their young. Regulation or homeostasis, which means steady state, allows living organisms to maintain stable internal environments, even though the outside environment is constantly changing. For example, in the summertime, many of us might constantly be trying to maintain our normal body temperature. Normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. But when we're outside in the summer heat, we tend to get warmer, right? We get hot. Our body then responds, trying to maintain homeostasis by sweating to cool us down. And then if we happen to go into a cold room with air conditioning, we might start getting too cold, in which case our body then will shiver to warm us back up. So we have this constant kind of fluctuation around our normal body temperature as our bodies work hard to maintain homeostasis, to maintain this steady state. All organisms also process energy for their daily activities and metabolism, like digesting food and then using those nutrients to build new molecules. And then finally, evolution, which you'll learn more about in the next course in our major series, a course called Biology 4B, is a result of changes, evolution is a result of changes that occur across many generations of an organism that increases the ability of the organism to adapt to their changing environments. So a few slides ago, we saw that order is one of the properties of life as living organisms are extremely organized. If we look at the organization of living things going from small to large, we start with the atoms that you learned about in chemistry. If you put two or more atoms together, you get molecules. Macromolecules are large molecules, such as carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and something called nucleic acids. And, and these include molecules like DNA. Inside the cell, so I'm going to skip over here and go to cells first. We have tiny functional units that play important roles in the cell called organelles. In larger organisms, groups of similar cells that carry out similar functions come together to form structures that we call tissues. And then if you have a bunch of different tissues together, you can form organs and organ systems, and that falls within the organism. I'm going to use the next slide that has a picture to describe the next levels of organization, but they are listed and described here as well from populations to the biosphere. All right, so we talked about the previous levels of organization up to the organism. If we look at populations, populations are all the individuals of a single species living in a specific area such as all the pine trees in a forest. Communities, on the other hand, are the sum of all populations in a certain area. So if we're looking at the forest and I'm looking at communities, communities, this would be all the trees, all the flowers, the insects, all of the animals that might live in the forest and all the plants, etc. Ecosystems, if we're looking at an ecosystem, this includes all of the living, living refers or is also known as the biotic, and the non-living, abiotic things in an area. And this could be like nitrogen in the soil or water in the area. So that is part of the ecosystem. And finally, the biosphere 
includes all of the ecosystems on Earth. And it rep represents pretty much all of the zones where we find life on Earth, including land, water, and even some parts of the atmosphere. So one of the reasons biology is such a broad topic is that we have so many different living organisms that we know about today, and probably even more that we don't know about yet. This picture shown here is something called a phylogenetic tree. Phylogenetic trees are diagrams that show the evolutionary relationship among different species based on their similarities and differences in their genetic traits and their physical traits, or sometimes a combination of the two. And here we have things called nodes and branches that make up a phylogenetic tree. Nodes are where the lines come together. Like here's a node, here's a node, and these represent common ancestors. The branches, these branches, like the one shown here, and then there's one here kind of on the left. The branches or the length of each branch is proportional to the time elapsed since the split, since the organism evolved. So the further away from the common ancestor, such as over, all the way over here, the more recent the organism. So the common ancestor that we have between bacteria, archaea, and eukarya is down here at this bottom node over here. And then we can see animals, fungi, plants. Those are all pretty recent organisms. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, biology is such a broad topic because there are so many different living organisms to study and how they interact with their environments. So as we go through this course, you'll probably encounter subtopics that you're not as interested in and some subtopics that are really appealing to you. And we're probably going to encounter many of these subtopics um, during your studies. For example, in my own studies during undergrad, one of my majors was biochemistry. And here I studied metabolic reactions in detail. Later on in grad school, I started working with microbes in my studies in gene therapy. So definitely feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in a particular field, and I will try to help you get more information about it. So that takes us to the end of chapter one material, and I'll see you guys next time when we start chapter two. Thanks.